Hello and welcome back to the KECC channel, I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today we continue with the compilation videos which are aimed at people who are working or people who are driving or people who just have a heck of a lot of time and want something on in the background. Today we're jumping into some pro and nuclear revenge. Our first story today comes to us from Backbiter0723. I'm lazy? Guess you don't need my labor then. Let's jump right in. This is a long one with a lot of context. You have been warned. Back before my grandfather passed, he had connected me with a friend of his who had a friend willing to give me a summer job when I turned 18. It was a pretty solid gig to do in the summer before I went to college, and it paid well, $15 an hour in Ohio. While it's not record-breaking, it certainly beat working fast food. I only worked about a month between my birthday and when I started college, but I proved to be a good worker who got the job done faster and better than anyone else. A couple things about this business. This friend of my grandfather started it himself in the 80s. It has something like 40 employees and is a machine shop that mostly deals in government contracts. They do everything from pew pew stocks and computer casings for the military to chemical wash tubs and lamps. Your average guy here was a 40 something dude and there were only two women in the whole place, the secretary and a lady in quality control. When we got sent home for the pandemic in March 2020, I pretty quickly came to be strapped for cash and went back. Since they fulfilled government contracts, their business was deemed necessary and they stayed open. I worked from early April until August that year and made a pretty decent chunk of change as he raised me from $15 to $17 an hour and put me in the shop running CNC machines. Before that, I'd been putting something called heli coils into machine parts, which basically just make the threads where bolts go heavy duty. Not a very hard job, but very time consuming. That being said, I was very good at this job. On average, I'd finish twice as many parts a shift as the next guy, who'd been working there for about 25 years. This will be important later. We didn't go back to school in fall 2020 as the pandemic was still happening, but I'd saved up enough cash at the place to be comfortable for a while. I took that fall off school, hoping that by spring we'd be back on campus. In the meantime, I signed up to volunteer with the Red Cross. I drove vans for them, transporting blood from their donor center and lab in Cleveland to area hospitals, as far out as Sharon, PA. I absolutely loved it, as helping people and doing fulfilling work is very important to me. Soon enough, I was the team leader out of the location in my city and was running three shifts a week, which would each span anywhere from five to eight hours. In spring 2021, I also moved into a new role as the chief of staff for an esports organization on my campus. I'll post another story about that later, which ate up a lot of my time. Nobody else on our board did much work, and I was the only one with experience talking to administration, so I got nailed with a ton of busy work. But again, it was something I loved to do, just to see all the happy folks at the events we, well, I, organized. Both the Red Cross and this esports thing were also very important resume builders for me, as they gave me leadership and bureaucratic experience that looks really good on a political science and communications resume, which is what I'm studying in college. Needless to say, the machine shop work didn't do that for me. It was money and little more. In the months leading up to fall 2021, it became clear to me that, with the savings I had, I wouldn't be able to afford to finish college. I would have to work while I was in school, something of 30 hours a week to make it work. At this point, I decided to go back to the shop for a few days to make a little extra cash before I head out, and line up 8 days on the schedule to work, 4 weeks working Thursday and Friday. I'm doing this because I am still taking 3 or more volunteer shifts a week with the Red Cross, plus my responsibilities with the eSport organization. My boss does in fact know about both of these things. The shop put me back in the assembly room, installing those coils in some wash tubs. Each part has about 50 different coils in three different sizes, and each part is so heavy that they have to be moved with a small one-ton crane in the assembly room. Then, on top of that, the coils had a nasty habit of not going in right or otherwise failing, so we'd have to remove and reinstall five or more coils apart. Because of this, most people only finished five or six parts a shift. I, however, am particularly efficient and take pride in my work, so I'd get 10 on most days. 
The shipment had 80 tubs left when they pulled me in for those eight days, and I was going to work on those tubs the whole time. My boss reckoned that with just me on the tubs, I'd be able to finish the shipment before I left, whereas he'd have to put two of his other workers on the job to do the same without me. I promise you, he knew this going in. On the fifth day of work, I'm starting to get pretty burnt out, and the stress of affording college was starting to get to me. I had one job lined up and a number of applications outstanding. I wasn't necessarily worried, just a bit wound up, tense, and exhausted. I voiced my frustrations to my boss and my worries about affording college. That's when this guy, a 70-something multi-millionaire who just pushes papers all day, decided to piss me off. Instead of consoling me in any way, offering reassurance, or dare I say, a bonus for my clearly excess productivity, which he brought me in for, he decides to go with, there's 168 hours in a week, work as much as you like. I push back and say that I literally cannot do that. I'm working 11am to 7pm Monday through Wednesday with Red Cross, and fill most of my weekends and evenings with networking and emails for esports. I could not take more hours in this job without giving up one of two activities which are more professionally relevant to me or taking a hit to my sleep. Even if I did all those things and worked 60 hour weeks, I only had one week left before I went back to campus. Needless to say, even with 20 hours of overtime pay, I still would not have been able to magically afford college. I'd still have to work two jobs as a full-time student either way. But wait, there's more. After I tell him I literally cannot take more hours without it being a detriment to my career or mental health, he goes on to tell me that I am lazy, irresponsible, and have never worked for a thing in my life. I'll remind you, I am, far and away, his most productive worker when I am in the shop, whether I'm running machines or installing coils. I will also note that my family makes a whopping $25,000 a year as a family of four. It's enough to live on in Northeast Ohio, but that's about it. Everything I own and use, including my phone, car, insurance, computer, I pay for with my own money that I earned working in this guy's shop. At this point, I ask myself why I'm bothering with this guy. Then I remember, he's relying on me to finish this batch of parts. Everyone else is tied up on different orders. If I leave, this shipment goes unfinished and he'll be forced to delay. I only have three days left scheduled to work, and that money isn't going to do anything for me if I'm going to be working 30 hours a week anyways. So why am I here? The next morning, I text him at 6am in the morning and tell him I'm not going to come in for the remainder of my shifts. This man, who I'll remind you is a 70-something multi-millionaire, loses his mind. In text, he's cursing out the wazoo, telling me how I'm destroying his business and how I effed him over, and how if I was actually smart with money, I would have quit my volunteer activities and put in the work. I keep it respectful and inform him that his disrespect lost him a valuable employee, and now he's gotta pay the price. I later found out from a coworker that the shipment ended up being about a month late. Because of how this shop's contracts work, he'd have to refund 1% of the contract price for each day the shipment is late. For this contract, 30% late fees would have amounted to around $200,000. Maybe if he was smarter with money, he wouldn't have hinged $200,000 of late fees on the work ethic of one lazy, irresponsible, 20-year-old kid who's never worked for a thing in his life. I'm struggling to see how a guy who is in his 70s and a multi-millionaire who has clearly been in business for a very long time couldn't see that a bonus would have been the best option in this case. Management in these stories seems to have a history of crapping on the people who actually know what's going on and then having to figure out what to do when those people crap back on the management. Do me a quick favor and take a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're actually not subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. This next story comes to us from Amenadiel. I was unemployed. This guy scammed me. Revenge is still pouring on him. Let's jump right in. First and foremost, this didn't happen in the US. Some events might be pursuable up there, but down here, it was mostly no man's land regarding the kind of scams I fell for. 
for the sake of this story, here in No Man's Land, we use the top level domain NML. My wife is a nurse. Back then, in the early 2000s, she worked in an ICU of a relatively exclusive and therefore expensive hospital. Specifically, she had to care for patients that had undergone cardiac surgery. At the time, I was working for a small company that was going out of business. The owners were retiring, we hadn't secured any important contracts lately, and in my country, you have to pay for employee severance unless you file for bankruptcy. So they decided to shut it down while they still had enough cash to pay our severances. One day my wife calls me and tells me about this gentleman in his late 50s that had been in the verge of passing away. And after that close call, he was so grateful and stuff, we'll call him Benny Lowy. This gentleman happened to work in electronics imports, which gave him access to incredibly convenient deals. Long story short, he was so grateful he could sell us an LCD TV, a stored demo unit that had been used just once and we'd need to pay like one quarter of its retail price as long as we kept it quiet because he was risking his relation with the brand. It caught me off guard. I said yes and she paid. Anyway, the only TV in the house had been a wedding present and weighed over a hundred pounds. We were eager to replace it. I was naive, I know, but I thought being her patient, she knew all personal data from this guy, so it seemed unlikely he would target her for a scam. His father was a known businessman, now retired and approaching his 80s. Mr. Lowy Sr. was well respected in his community and wouldn't have let his son wreak havoc. Also, my wife had acquaintances in common with Benny's brother, a known doctor of another hospital. Christmas was approaching, she asked Benny, who had been already discharged and back home, for advice regarding the present she wanted to give me, a phone. He hooked her up with the best she could think of. Now, I can't remember the exact model, but it was the Sony Ericsson flagship, and it wasn't yet offered by local carriers. He had access to it because of his status as a local representative for said brand. She went with it, paid. The job position. I've said my employer was shutting down, so just for the sake of it, she asked Benny if he knew of someone needing an IT guy. Of course, he said, I'll meet your husband at this place tomorrow, etc. And there I was, in a gas station uptown. He pulled over in a luxury car. Mr. Lowy was a normal looking guy, used a cane and had a noticeable knee or hip pain. We sat down in the gas station coffee shop and he told me about a mid-management position, reporting to him, in a mining company I had barely heard about. He coached me on what should I say in the upcoming job interview. We spoke about salary. I was dazzled. Wait, mining? Didn't you say he was into imports? He was that kind of guy you can't pause to question, because he'd already thrown something extra to the mix, and this position had a better paycheck than the one I was being laid off. In the next days, we had a few phone calls. Stuff looked promising. I had been already laid off. We agreed he'd pick me up on December 24th, and he'd introduce me to senior managers as the recommended help desk junior manager. I woke up extra early, put on my best suit, waited in the front yard, hours went by. I had planned to be back before noon to arrange stuff for that night's dinner because my parents were coming over. After calling him repeatedly, he told me he'd been assaulted and robbed. They took my cane and broke it on my knee, he wailed. Poor guy. I told him to forget about my interview for the time being. No, no, I promised you I'll make it up to you. Of course, since he had been injured, he wasn't able to deliver the items my wife bought from him. That night, my mother asked me about the new job. I could not bring myself to tell her about the delay. I told her it was going fine. That night, I googled him. Nothing showed up except for some awards in the Imports and Customs Associations of whatever. He called me to reschedule our interview. December 31st. Again, picture me in my best suit outside my house on a summer morning. Of course, he didn't show up. When I finally reach him, he tells me that when his car had been stolen last week, they took his wallet too, which these thugs eventually dropped during another robbery. So now he had been detained as a suspect for that. He hadn't been able to pick the imported electronics on the customs office, so they had them move to another custody unit where it would take a couple of weeks to retrieve. That night, we went to my parents for New Year's Eve, and my mother asked me for the new job. It's all fine, I said. 
I Google him again, this time with variations regarding his name or the supposed company he was setting me into. Not much showed up, nothing shady. The next call was like a week later. He told me that because he was being involved in a police investigation, this mining company had fired him. But this was actually good because now I was going to be interviewed to take his position as IT manager. This meant double my former paycheck and securing a position that would be a leap forward in my career. So I don't ask many questions. I was just grateful. All those delays in the end would pay off. This situation, as you have already figured out, went on and on for weeks. My interview never happened. The electronics never arrived. We had lost our money, our time, our Christmas, our hopes, and I was still unemployed and hadn't been applying for job offers since I had this one allegedly secured. I texted him somewhere in between. I texted him, why are you doing this to us? He texted back, if I wanted to, you have nothing on me, but if you stick with me, you'll be rewarded tenfold. Cue in the detective. Time went by. Eventually, my wife overhears from a coworker about this patient in another hospital she was working at. Some nurses do work part-time at other hospitals. She had fell for it too, but her husband was a detective. So a few hours later, we were filling him in on the details of the scam we fell for. Asking around, he found a third nurse scammed by this guy. Soon enough, he was detained, this time for real, and admitted to have been scamming people due to an impromptu invited mild dementia. This detective talks him into an off-court deal in which he gave us back every cent, but not my time nor hopes, in exchange for us not pursuing any legal action. This was a decent deal, because us, having failed to make a written agreement on any of these purchases, had at most a weak claim to our money. By the way, the money with which he paid us, he had to borrow from his father and some from his brother, the doctor. Remember, this didn't happen in the US. This agreement was actually completely legal down there. So I made a blog. I couldn't go for any further legal action, but there wasn't a non-disclosure agreement whatsoever. And I thought, what could prevent other people falling into the scammer's lies? Well, perhaps some Google results? So I created a blog on WordPress. Think something like BennyLoweyTheScammer.wordpress.com. It was a single post in third person telling my story. In the following days, that post comments had a dozen stories much like mine. I made them into posts. A few of them got their comments too, telling other people's stories. In a few weeks, looking for Benny Lowy's name on Google led to this blog. In my country, you can review updates regarding court ongoing cases, except for felonies. Those are non-public searching for his national ID, which I had known thanks to our settlement, as the sued party. I could just find an eviction action due to failing to pay his condo's lease. But looking for him as the suing part, I found out he had sued WordPress, our local fictionary domain, which was registered by a local guy on GoDaddy. Following up with the case, this guy had spent months trying to demonstrate this local guy had to take down the blog I made in the .com domain. Go figure. I was tempted then and there to set a post on this blog saying, if I wanted to, you have nothing on me. However, I have never attempted to let him know who's doing this. I just log into this blog once in a while. Today was the first one in years and keep finding in the comments more scammed people all of them in a vulnerable moment in their life. Unemployed guys, small startups looking for an angel investor, small branch salespeople pursuing a promising commission. Those who have, in time, reached a compensation or agreement. It's because Benny's now ancient father had to chip in. From what they say, his brother has gone no contact. Most commenters leave their email addresses, and I have known a few that have teamed with each other and succeeded in legal actions. Perhaps this is not a revenge, but it's my story. Unfortunately, in this case, people getting scammed by this guy aren't really going to start Googling him until they're well into the scam. Hopefully, when they find out this information, though, they will stop from getting swindled any further and they can take corrective action. This next story comes to us from I Am Herding Cats. I'm a team builder. Let's jump right in. A few years ago, I was sitting in a job interview and the hiring manager asked, what do you consider the greatest accomplishment of your career? 
this gave me pause, as I've been doing the same thing for over 25 years. I let the mists of memory transport me back in time. Dorian, the nurse manager. Kip, the program manager. Dr. Steve, the clinical director. Yes, I had three bosses. I started on the unit as an already seasoned, jaded RN, and soon discovered that most staff who worked there were very, very young and inexperienced. For many, this was their first real job. They assumed all the weird stuff that happened every day was just normal for the workplace. Dorian had decreed that no one was allowed to write incident reports for med errors or safety issues because it makes me look bad in safety huddle. Non-clinical staff allowed to pass meds, schedule changes without notice. Additionally, the department was easily the most toxic I've ever worked in, with various cliques at constant war with one another. I could go on and on. The troubles began one day when I opened my email to a message from Dorian which stated very curtly that I was being investigated for an incident which had happened on the unit, that I was to meet with HR to discuss it, and for possible disciplinary action. I was not to discuss the incident with anyone. No date was given, no medical record number, no indication what the issue could be. I replied that I would need the above information, would speak with my union rep, and meet at a time convenient for me. Dorian declined to give information. I declined to meet with him. I began receiving emails almost daily, each more threatening than the last. I printed them all, contacted my sister, the employment attorney, tried not to start shaking whenever I had to check my email. I was keenly aware that this is Intimidation 101, but it is remarkably effective even when you know that. Because I'm not a direction follower, I was soon discussing this in the break room and before I knew it, had been approached by three other women who had all received the same email on the same day. Comparison showed the emails being sent about a minute apart. We did not work the same shifts nor the same days. We agreed to call in the union rep and refused to meet with HR. Dorian continued to escalate, including cornering us in the hall, stepping in chest to chest and trying to stare us down. He was a very big guy. Before long, we were speaking to more and more women and it came to light that Dorian had a habit of targeting them with this exact email, followed by others that were more and more threatening until the person would finally meet with HR, get written up for something vague, and then be forced to sign a non-disclosure, no retaliation agreement. It seemed that he had simply picked the wrong four women this time because we were not having it. I can't tell you how much time at work began to be spent with people crying while recounting their stories. None had thought to call in the union rep. They did not even know their Weingarten rights. We began to plot. We had limited time and our company has a long and unglamorous history of protecting people like this. Before long, the entire team was united against the common enemy. LGBTQ staff wrote up statements backed with witnesses of grossly homophobic comments, often in the presence of patients. Staff who were immigrants made statements about racial slurs. A staff who was incredibly petty and vindictive had been compiling a dossier on every perceived policy violation and wrongdoing on Dorian's part since his hiring date, and he prepped it for presentation to HR. The graveyard shift, all huge men said, Obviously, Dorian isn't trying to flex on us, but we want to help. So they spent a couple nights cruising Dorian's social media posts and capturing screenshots of homo, trans, xenophobic, and misogynistic content. Worried that they hadn't done enough, the night staff paid for a cheap background check and what a score. DUI, failure to appear, hit and run, domestic violence, assault with a deadly weapon. Did the company not do a background check? WTF. Finally, two women came forward with complaints of sexual harassment. One incident had even occurred in the presence of the assistant manager, and one was documented in an email. We were ready. We flooded HR with meeting requests, and our union rep coordinated the assault so that on Monday, we met for simple harassment and intimidation. I met first, and HR seemed unimpressed by my complaint. Tuesday, all LGBTQ and staff subjected to racial slurs made their formal complaints. They said that the HR lady looked tired. Wednesday started with the background check, moved into the minutia of policy violation, and culminated with well-documented quid pro quo sexual harassment. 
The union rep informed HR that the union's attorney was eager to know how to proceed. HR assured her that would not be necessary. That evening, Dorian posted a sign on his office door saying he would be away for a few days and to contact Kip or Dr. Steve if we needed anything. Graveyard Shift reported that over the weekend, housekeeping came and removed everything from his office except his name tag, which the night staff took as a trophy. On Monday at Shift Change, the CNO, COO, and HR met with the team and informed us that, effective immediately, Dorian was no longer employed by the hospital. We all sat silently and politely until they exited the unit, when a loud and spontaneous cheer went up. People were hugging each other and cry laughing. High fives all around. Aftermath. To the best of my knowledge, Dorian never worked as an RN again. Frankly, I don't care. Kip was fired three days later for having been aware of all that was going on and turning a blind eye. And because apparently, he'd been touching women on the unit for a couple years. I hadn't been aware of that, but it came out in the HR meeting. Dr. Steve was also fired for sexual harassment. The unit hired an old manager of mine who had a long and well-documented history of, you guessed it, sexual harassment. I quit within days of him being offered the job. The department's foray into getting along crumbled. Most of the staff have moved on to other jobs where they seem much happier. What do you consider the greatest accomplishment of your career? I sat up straight, smiled, and said, I took a very fractured team and brought them together to achieve a common goal. I like to think I'm really good at team building. Sometimes it only takes one brave voice to get everybody else rallied behind a cause. In this case, getting a piece of human scum removed from a workplace. What I don't understand is why the company would bring somebody else in who has a history of doing what they just fired people for. That makes absolutely no sense at all. This next story comes to us from Mr. Cheese Gummy Bear. Ew. Bully in the jungle. Let's jump right in. I want to share a story from my childhood. I'm not 100% sure it can be called pro, but it certainly felt pro to me. This happened somewhere between 1994 and 1999. Back then, we lived on a military base in the country where I'm from. Most of the kids in my street knew each other and normally played together and had a lot of fun, except for Oliver and his two goons. Oliver was a little older than us, but much stronger and a lot meaner. Because it was such a close community, we crossed each other all the time. Martial arts, all together, and Oliver kicked our butts. Playing out in the street, we needed to keep away from his house just in case he was there. Oliver was our full-blown bully. Behind our houses, after you crossed the property line of each backyard, there was a huge forest, more like a jungle, jungle and my friends and I would explore the jungle almost every day. Me being the person that knew more of the land, mostly because my dad trained me to know wherever since I was like five, so I wouldn't get lost. At the same time, I learned to make small rope traps, trip wires, and little things like that. I loved trapping and catching my next door neighbor's chickens. Because of this, my friends and I created the Jungle Challenge, where I would create a bunch of trip wire traps and counterweight pulley traps the kind that you step on a branch and a rope would catch your foot and pull you, in a part of the jungle behind my house. Honestly, I made a couple and took credit for the vines and holes in the area. Years go by and one day, my dad decides to create a little goat pen deep in the jungle part behind my house. Me knowing that he was going to go deeper than what we, kids, were allowed to go, asked to tag along and go with him, and he said yes. Guys, it was awesome. The spot he picked was right after a tree formation that made a little roundabout. Enough backstory, let's get to the revenge. One day, I find myself alone behind the gym where we had our karate and jujitsu classes. All my friends went home for the day and I hear behind, uh, hey, Oliver is there with his brand new orange belt. So I hear you're now in two different classes. Yeah, my dad put me in them. He wants, do you think you can beat me? I get nervous. You think that taking more classes you'll kick my butt or something? No, I just... At that moment, he fully kicks my chest and stomach, getting me winded. No matter what you do, you won't beat me. He leaves, and I go home after crying and composing myself. I needed to stop this, but how? He was stronger than me, older than me, and just a brute. Then it clicked. 
I have only confronted him in his terrain, with his rules, where he had the upper hand. So I came up with a plan. I created a trap at the tree roundabout, where if you triggered a tripwire, a big, heavy, old, and rusted car part that I found back there, later I learned it was an old car transmission part, would fall from above. After a few hours of setting up and asking my friends about Oliver, we always knew where he and his friends were, so we didn't cross paths, and they told me. I went over and, from a safe distance, screamed, Hey, buttface! Or something like that. I'm tired of your crap, we're settling this today. I threw a small rock and ran for dear life. When I started heading to the jungle, Oliver's two friends stopped him and said to him, Dude, I think this is a bad idea. Oliver shoulder shrugs them off and said something that I couldn't hear and continued chasing me. He followed me to the roundabout tripping and falling a lot, which made me extremely happy. And I thought, it is going to work. I jump in the center of the circle, but he stops, looks around, looks at me, and then looks down and sees the fishing line. Oliver looks up at me and says, Do you think I'm stupid? I can totally see this steps over the line, and branch cracks, fast zipping noise. Oliver looks down at his foot, looks where the line is zipping on the tree to his right, and looks up, and bam, right on his head. I was extremely happy. But then Oliver dropped, didn't get hit hard on the head and start crying like I envisioned, just dropped. I see blood. So I panicked and ran straight home. I run through my backyard, passing Oliver's friends, and lock myself in home. Hours go by and nothing happens, but I'm scared, terrified. The main reason why I'm so afraid is that this is a military base. If a kid gets lost, it's a huge deal. So what normally happened is that if a kid got lost, they, their friends, would come to get me or one of my friends because all kids in this part of the base knew that we were the weird kids that were always out there. And within an hour or so, we would come back with the kid and no big deal, if the kid was unharmed. I don't want to be the one having to go get Oliver or find him because then the adults need to get involved and that was just going to be horrible. It was getting dark by now. Everyone was supposed to be home, but I hear that they were still looking for him. Turns out that he walked out of the jungle a little before 7, not completely dark yet, and made it home. The next day, his friends came by. Oliver refused to talk about it, and from then on, we never spoke about it. He didn't mess with me or my friends, and never again approached me. Every now and then, one of my friends would ask if it was true that you took Oliver to the jungle and kicked his butt, but I wouldn't answer. Part out of fear, and part out of pride, I guess. And that's how I took revenge on my first bully. OP, this one goes way too far. You could have killed that kid. In fact, I think you're extremely lucky that you didn't. I do understand that this story was about 30 years ago and you're writing about it on Reddit, so I'd assume you haven't done anything else that dumb going forward that resulted in hurting somebody else. So that's a good thing. This next story comes to us from Willingly Lost 90 punishing university student. Let's jump right in. Good evening. So, the backstory. I currently do armed security for one of the larger companies in my state and the adjacent states, and during COVID, I was promoted and got a company car. So, the patrol car is built and designed to the same specifications as the local police, including lights. The only difference is the decals and wording. Ours has the company name and then public safety. Each state I work in has different rules and tests to get a security license, including background check, fingerprints, etc. Okay, so on to the story. My post changes often as it's contract security, but on the weekend, Friday to Monday, I work 40 hours. I am on call during the week. So in my state, there's a massive college campus and dead center of the campus is a massive library. When I say massive, I mean the property is two city blocks. There are two separate entrances to the property for cars and multiple walking paths and even a beautiful courtyard. The main gate has two lanes, an entrance and an exit, along with a guard shack that is not used currently. It has two large beautiful wrought iron gates that get closed and locked once the staff leave. In front of the guard shack along with on each gate and two signposts, 
are warnings that this is not university parking. That if you park on the property outside of specified hours, you will be ticketed, your car will be booted, and when we open, you will be towed at your own expense. Behind the library are large dorms with street side parking. There's also a second entrance with same setup, warnings, etc., but no gate as mostly contractors use it. I apologize for all the setup. So recently the library adjusted the hours so they were open an extra hour and started hosting events. They changed all the signs and added a few inside the building. At 1800 hours, the main gate gets locked and secured. The way this is done is not overly effective. You basically drop a bar into a notch so that the gate can't be pushed in or out. But if you really try, you can still get it open by putting stuff under the bar and lifting. It never happened in the entire time I was there, until recently. I'm monitoring the cameras and notice a car pulls up to the gate, and a guy gets out, pushes on the gate, gets into his car, and leaves. No big deal, I flag it on the camera and do a report. About an hour later, the same car pulls up, and the guy gets out, goes to his trunk, pulls out a bar, and manages to get the gate open. He pushes the gate open and drives to the parking lot. The main entrance gets locked and secured at close, so I exit the building through the back entrance and proceed to walk to the parking lot to explain that he cannot park there. The guy gets upset, says there's no parking and the gate was already open. And before I can respond, he gets back in and drives away. I relock the door, do another report, and check the camera and get his plate. Fast forward to my next shift the next night and another car pulls up to the gate, gets it open, and pulls in. Once again, I get to the parking lot, explain you cannot park here, and it's not university property. It was the same guy. This time, I explained that next time I will not come confront him, and instead I will have his car ticketed. He gets angry, tells me off, and leaves. The next day, the guy returns. Same thing, he opens the gate, pulls in, looks around, and leaves. I radio dispatch, notify them of what's going on, and wait for the police. The police arrive, ticket the car, and boot it, and explain they're busy and will have it towed in the morning. I was not at that post until next weekend. Friday arrives, the car is gone, so I check the cameras, and he was indeed towed the next morning. I figured it was over. I was wrong. At 4pm, the library is still open but mostly empty, and I get paged to the front desk because they need assistance. It's the same guy who was towed. He's livid, yelling about how he was towed, and we can't do that, and how we have to repay him now or he won't leave. So here's the thing, I'm a big guy, tall and fat. He was maybe 5'3 and tiny, to the point I think the librarian could take him. So I walk up, explain that he needs to calm down and stop yelling, as this is a library, and once he calms down, we can discuss the issue. Naturally, he tells me to go fluff myself, and I'm just a fat lazy rent-a-cop who's useless and has no power. At this point, the library staff is done and they leave the immediate area to help one of the remaining guests check out books. The guy realizes he's not getting anywhere making a scene and says, I'll be back, and leaves. We all roll our eyes and I stand by the desk staff until we close. During the week I was off, the library took possession of some very valuable books that were going to be displayed in a rare book vault and had made the parking lots more secure. The cameras in the parking lot were updated to night vision and had enhanced zoom, PTZ camera. The other addition is they added gates on all the walkways that were pretty but also metal. They were held open by a magnet and when a button is pressed, all the gates close and cannot be opened unless the button is hit again. The main entrance gate also locks the same way if the button is pushed, so the entire property can be locked down. The only other way is a hidden keypad behind one of the no trespassing signs, and you have to know the code. Around 3am, I was doing a patrol inside the property when the cameras alerted me of activity near the main entrance to the building. I checked the cameras, and the same car was on property, but instead of being in a spot, he was pulled up to the entrance and was fidgeting with the glass front doors. Their lock deadbolted and chained closed. They're pretty thick, but not impenetrable. I hit the emergency button, radio dispatch, who alerted my supervisor, and they called the police. So earlier I stated two things. One was, I'm armed. 
firearm, and a taser. And two was, we are surrounded by university property, and the police station for the university is within sight of the library. In the time I ran to the front door and ordered the guy to stop and step away from the door immediately, and he is now being trespassed from the property, he turned from the door holding a long object. It was a fire poker and faced me. I repeated myself and told him to put down what's in his hand. He took a step towards me with the weapon in a position it could be swung or poked at me easily. I told him this was his last warning and to stop now. Naturally, he ignored me and stepped closer, so I deployed my taser. He stopped advancing pretty quickly. At that time, the main gate to the property swung open and three police cars with lights and sirens going pulled in and handcuffed him. His car was ticketed and towed again. He was charged with trespassing and breaking and entering. Once he was handcuffed, he started to struggle again because I guess being tased was not enough. Most universities have a code of conduct and attempting to break into a library most likely violates that code of conduct. You know, originally I thought this was a great pro-revenge story, it was a guy getting back at somebody who was making it difficult to do his job, and then I kind of sat back and went, is it really pro-revenge if he was just doing his job? I'd love to know what you guys think, comment down below. This next story comes to us from Chef231. Man gets car crushed. Let's jump right in. Cast OP, me, female, 5'11". Bob, my friend store manager, chief, my boss, entitled jerk who lost his car. Okay, background. I worked as a firefighter and as an investigator for an independent department. For information, an investigator was the rank of lieutenant and was based out of a large station. Two engines, one newer 110 tower ladder truck, relative later, one chief car, and one utility truck. Every day, the food duties changed from firefighter to firefighter. My chief's turn to cook when this happened. My friend Bob worked as a GM of a small grocery store. There was a long empty space in front of the store marked with the following sign, emergency vehicles only. Enter entitled jerk. He had a nice looking BMW car and always parked in the above spot every week. Bob told entitled jerk that he couldn't park there. I can park wherever I effing want. I make more in a day than you make in a week. My friend calls me complaining about entitled jerk. I agree to go and watch the spot. I get into our utility truck, which had the department decals on the door and a single red light on the dash. I park in the emergency vehicle's only spot. As I'm walking in, I hear, you can't park there, it's my special spot. I turn and look at entitled jerk. Excuse me, I ask. I'm on official duties and can park there. I pointed to the decal on the door. Entitled jerk looks and says, You can't be a firefighter, you're a girl. Move your truck and leave, C-word. Now, I'm proud of my job. In a department of 2000, I was one of five women in the department. I graduated top of my class. I have a shocked-looking expression on my face. I get really pissed off. I walk into my friend's office to get more information about his problem with Entitled Jerk. As Bob explains the continuous parking violations, and I see a small notice on the fire suppression system, sprinklers, that said the inspection was coming up. I smile as I get an idea. Cue the revenge. I get some information, leave Bob's office, and get into the truck heading back to the station. I arrive and head into my chief's office. I tell him of entitled jerk and what he says and does. Chief is a 6 foot 6, 320 pound Samoan. He sees everyone as family. Chief's face gets bright red. I explain my idea and he gets very happy. He rushes out and calls a station meeting. I lay out the idea. We send out the station to do a fire drill inspection by sending the old truck and one engine to the store. My friend will call the station the next time entitled jerk parks in the fire lane. Skip to two weeks later, Bob called the station stating that entitled jerk had just parked. As I am thanking him, I hear his fire alarm go off. I rush and change into my investigator uniform with turnout gear, tell chief, and send the trucks out. I ride in the Quint. We arrive and I see entitled jerk's car right in the emergency vehicle spot. I radio to have engine one pull right in front of entitled jerk's car and the truck to park right beside the driver's side door. I get out and the engineer starts setting up the ladder, which means four very large and heavy support struts go down 
and one crushes the front of his hood. The alarm goes off. The lineman breaks his windows as he runs the large 5-inch draft line from the pump to the standpipes, the fire access to the sprinkler system, through his front seats. I go in to find Bob hurriedly getting people out as the alarm is going off. Entitled Jerk runs out of the store, sees his car, and goes ballistic. I radio the police department dispatch and request a few officers to the store as I had a mail that was impeding a fire operation. The dispatcher says that they will send a few officers. Three officers show up and I ask them to follow me. They do when I call out. Hey, leave my firefighters alone! Entitled Jerk turns and sees me. He rushes up screaming that I'll pay for damaging his precious baby, his car. I stop him and tell him that if he didn't leave, that he would be arrested. He gets in my face. You did this, I'll have your job for this. He then turns, pushing me back. The officers and I rush and tackle Entitled Jerk to the ground. After they cuff him, I calmly inform Entitled Jerk that he was under arrest for assault and interference with a fire investigation, and that his car would be towed for parking in a fire lane. I later found out that it was crushed. Entitled Jerk got 12 months probation for pushing me and interfering with a fire operation. He also got a fine of $500 for parking, the cost of the tow, and he lost his nice BMW. Moral of this story? Okay, so I'm not a firefighter myself, but I don't think firefighters can arrest people, let alone assist the police with tackling the jerk. I can already see the comment section on this video. Why would you post a bunch of stories that just aren't true? Well, because it encourages you guys to comment, and I look forward to reading them. This next story comes to us from Nuclear Wasteoid. When the gift horse bites you back. Let's jump right in. My story begins about six years ago. I was a frequent and dedicated customer of a locally owned smoke and vape shop in my hometown. The owner heard me say I was looking and offered me a job. It will have to be under the table and I can't pay more than $10 an hour. I was just happy to be out of the house and seeing someone other than the kids and family. So the owner spent a day training me, gave me her cell number and door keys, then told me to call if I had any questions. That was it. No other info besides, call me if you need pricing. It was kind of a sink or swim thing. They then start another business in another state. My shop was in California, and they opened another business on the other side of the country. I went from Friday and Saturday to full time. I went two months without being paid because they just never came home. I finally told them, look, I'm basically running the place alone. I can do all the ordering and whatnot, send you it for approval, and then you can just stay there and pay me via Zelle. They said yes to all of it, except for the pay part. Instead, they would have their family friend, T, check the books and receipts, then check my hours, then pay me up to that date every two weeks. T got paid quite handsomely, but also took whatever she pleased from the shop too. I took note of everything she took, how long she was there, and sent all of it to the owner, Lisa. T did not like that, because it was all taken out of her pay. So she started being busy and not showing up to pay me when she was supposed to. Instead of every two weeks, it was every month or every five to six weeks. And I had to text my boss to beg for an advance of pay to get gas. So from two days a week to seven days a week with 10 hour days, Lisa and her hub refused to pay for expensive software. So I did all the supply list, ordering and tax stuff on my Google Drive and sent the info they wanted by email. Eventually, I began to get calls that I had the wrong music playing on the stereo. I played reggae and she wanted hardcore rap, that she wanted that or this customer out now, which I generally ignored because they were paying customers after all, or things like that. I began updating and improving the shop at their request, all on my own dime that they swore to reimburse, which brought in a bunch of customers and new stock. Our CBD section and customer base bloomed, our vape section went from two shelves to an entire wall and people from other cities came to our shop because I could repair almost anything that was broken. Our water tobacco pipes area became huge with hand-blown glass pieces from famous and very well-known artists on sale. From my connections, they got them hella cheap and boosted that price 400% to sell them. 
Basically, I took a small town, rinky-dink vape and smoke shop, and made it hugely successful, very profitable, and well known across the state. All this time, I was told I would be getting a percentage of the profits, and that I was family, and they always treat family well, with profit sharing being done at Christmas. Christmas comes and I am told, our other biz is doing bad, can we pay you the percentage in six months? I agreed. More the idiot I. COVID happened, but we kept our heads above water, becoming listed as necessary business. I pointed out their business license still listed them as selling food and snacks, even though they didn't. So we stayed open. All the other shops cut their hours or closed, but we were pulling in cash like never before. Tea was still coming sporadically, and I was working my butt off, but since I loved the shop and my customers, I tolerated it. But as I was massively overworked, I eventually paid for it. I was admitted into the hospital for two weeks for exhaustion and a heart condition that the exhaustion made worse. The whole time I was in there, my boss kept calling and making me prove I was in the hospital. I had calls constantly from T who filled in, and just in general, Lisa was pissy as hell I was in the hospital and not her shop. I get out and back in the shop, and she asked me to work on a huge project for her. Scan five years worth of register receipts, enter the daily totals for all five years into a spreadsheet separated by year. Cash, credit, CBD cash, CBD credit, credit report, total bank deposit, hours worked, discounts given, etc. Took me three weeks to do it all, saved to my Google Drive. Then emailed to Lisa. Never thought about it again. Then she calls me, frantic because the accountant said it looks like we made way too much during COVID. I told Lisa that we had been the only shop open, that was the difference. She demanded I resend the spreadsheets, but only the part for that year, 2020. I do. Then, out of nowhere, she fires me, sends in T with T's daughter, my replacement, and tells me to pack up and leave. No final pay, no reimbursement for the profit sharing, nothing. I called Lisa, and she tells me something that pisses me off to this day. You're bringing in the wrong kind of people. I didn't work that hard to update and open that place for you to fill it with this and this. That is it. And that she would settle up my last pay later. She didn't. I was pissed. I left. I'm a lesbian. She knew that. When our store was at its worst during COVID, the LGBTQ community came together and supported the shop because I was there and we all helped one another. Our biggest and best paying customers were LGBTQ. So I let all of them know what was said. I also told a few well-placed people about what Lisa had said during our phone call. I also had numerous texts where she had screen capped the security feed and pointed out people to run off who strangely had all been POC. I also told the leader of the local LGBTQ association and the Chamber of Commerce leaders what had been said and showed my proof. As they were former customers of mine, they were appalled and spread it far and wide, utterly destroying their customer base. A month after firing me, she called, apologizing for the firing and making up excuses for not paying me, then asking where I had saved that spreadsheet. I told her that it was all on my Google Drive. She said if I sent it to the accountant again, she would settle up. Just don't send her 2020, she already has that one. So, after making my life miserable for years, putting me in the hospital, and then firing me just to pay T's daughter $5 an hour more, yeah, I am taking my revenge. She gave me the number of her accountant so that I could make sure the info got to her. I called Miss Accountant and asked her, can you send me what you do have? I don't want you to have to go through duplicate documents if you don't have to. See, I knew that Lisa had been tweaking numbers and figures so that her other business, Medical MJ, could funnel through the store and be seen as legit. See, if you sell Medical MJ, you couldn't really put it into a normal bank because if the feds wanted to, they could seize it because it is still federally illegal and banks are under federal rules. You had to prove that the money didn't come from selling medical MJ to get it back, which could take years. There are banks that deal solely with people in the MJ business, but even the cheapest account at the cheapest institution had a $1,000 a month flat fee. This was back in 2020 though, maybe it's different now. 
My boss was not one to pay money like that just for a bank account, so she was laundering it through her store. Her accountant thought the numbers were suspicious, but had no proof until now. I was sent all the spreadsheets that Lisa had sent her, and wow, was she in trouble. She was claiming that our little store was making over $10,000 a day more than we really were. And it all started happening in, you guessed it, 2020. So I accidentally sent her the real spreadsheets for 2020 with all the scanned receipts and the credit report scans and the bank deposit scans. All the info needed to really blast Lisa into the stratosphere. The accountant called and asked me, are these all real? Are you sure these are the right figures? I said, yep. All she needed to do was click on the day and it hyperlinked you to all that day's info. Register receipt for the day, the square breakdown for the CBD sold that day, and the bank deposit and credit report receipts. I told her that these were the fully updated and accurate info for that year. I remember the accountant sounded stunned. She disliked my boss as much as I did for her lies, late payments, and utter contempt she treated her with. I emailed Lisa and told her all the info was sent and that I was waiting for the payment as promised. Surprise, surprise, she blocked me and no payment went through. As I was paid under the table, it was a she said, she and her husband and her best friend and her new worker said, so it was the least I could do to take her and her lying butt down. I also looked up the IRS tips email and sent them copies of the real and altered files, along with a copy of their business license. They would ask me to text them copies of them and their tobacco license and then also called code enforcement and let them know that their fire alarm system didn't work, that they had no emergency exit, and their extinguisher hasn't been serviced in four years. They just sent a friend to fake it. I turned them into the FDA website for selling to underage customers. The new cashier was selling to underage all the time, and then sent in an anonymous tip that they were selling carts and wax they had made at their new business on the East Coast and were selling out of the shop. The fallout was glorious. They were shut down by code enforcement and the fire department for having black mold on the walls due to leaks they refused to fix, exposed wiring, no up-to-date servicing on the fire alarm system, and the fire extinguisher was inoperable. They were shot by the FDA and had to pay some pricey fines for three different underage sales and had their tobacco license pulled. Right now, the IRS is doing a complete audit of the last 10 years of the store's taxes, and they shut the store's doors for good about two months ago. The bad part? I never got to hear what happened to their East Coast medical MJ business. Huh. Oh well, them's the breaks, I guess. OP, if you were the one running that business completely from, like, day one, I'm guessing you might be able to set up your own and run it very successfully. All you would need is a little startup capital. A lot of people in the comments for this one commented that OP was a bit of a doormat, and OP kind of agreed with them, but they also said that they weren't recording their income properly and that was kind of illegal too. So there was not really a way that they could report them without it coming back on themselves as well. This next story comes to us from Golera1. Hi Poo Drifter, let's jump right in. Many years ago, while recovering from a brutal marriage, I was a struggling single parent putting myself through grad school on a small teaching associate stipend. I was able to rent a modest apartment within walking distance of the urban campus. It was part of a series of small 100-year-old brick townhouses, which I imagine were very nice in their day. Over the years, as old buildings do, it had settled and the doors and windows were askew enough to be drafty. In the snowy winter, we applied plenty of shrink wrap window cling. In the summer, the brick building was like an oven, with no central AC, and ventilation was necessary to stave off heat stroke. Despite the hardships, we were safe, and we were content. After a couple of years, though, this changed when a new dude moved into a nearby apartment. Because out of the scores of parking spaces behind the apartment block, he was assigned the parking space right behind mine. The guy was, apparently, an avid fan of the Fast and the Furious franchise, having made various mods to his car and a vanity plate reading Drifter. He spent all of his free time working on this stupid car. 
but the idiot had clearly neglected the car's actual engine and exhaust system. Because in order to drive the thing, he had to warm it up for 10 to 15 minutes before driving off. Every. Single. Time. And it wasn't regular car exhaust. It was billowing and extra rich and smelled like the gasoline wasn't fully burning off. As I mentioned in the beginning, the apartment was old and drafty. So every time he decided to drive his car, sometimes several times a day, he would first let it billow clouds of noxious exhaust fumes into nearby apartments and right into my four-year-old's bedroom. I tried everything to keep the fumes out, but to no avail. My child and I both felt ill every time. This was hurting my kid. I couldn't afford to move, and I was out of ideas. Seeing that he was outside working on his car again, but without giving too many details about myself, I approached the guy and explained that the fumes were filling my apartment and making me ill, and politely asked if he would mind warming up his car farther away from the surrounding apartments. He sneered at me and said, Well, I'm sorry, but not all of us are lucky enough to have mommy and daddy pay for their car and put them through college. I'm sorry that my car is not up to your standards, but I'm not moving it. Shocked, I walked off in a different direction than my apartment, so he wouldn't know exactly where I lived. By the time I got home, I was angry, fuming. I knew some sort of formal complaint would likely go nowhere. Besides, it would be truly stupid to be the only person to do so right before whatever I was going to do next. I took some time to monitor his comings and goings and plan some proper consequences to fix the problem myself. The goal, to end the daily poisoning of my apartment and danger to my child permanently. Budget, shoestring of course, because I didn't have mommy and daddy to pay for my revenge budget. Skill level, low. The problem was the engine, and I had very little knowledge about how to quickly, quietly, and permanently disable an engine. I didn't know how to jimmy a lock or open a lock gas cap, so I wouldn't be able to get access to the engine or gas tank. And no, I was not about to Google instructions. Time available, minutes at most. The parking lot was a very busy place. Students came and went at all hours of the day and night and sometimes just hung out there to party or set nearby dumpsters on fire. As much as I wanted to, I couldn't just douse the car in gasoline or set it on fire, because it was parked way too close to my apartment. Cosmetic damage wouldn't work, slashing tires or breaking windows, while satisfying, could be too loud and not permanent. And then on reconnaissance day two, I noticed it. His car was old enough to have little triangle windows for venting in the back windows, and he kept them open at night. The answer, I would fight fumes with fumes. The next day, I bought a cheap Gatorade squeeze bottle and some eggs. I made a yellow soup out of egg yolks and warm water to fill up the bottle about two-thirds full, then added some of the fresh dog poo that was always available next to the sidewalk outside. I screwed the cap onto the bottle and left it in the sun outside for several days, swirling it around from time to time. I waited for the early hours of a Tuesday morning when the parking lot was the least busy and snuck up to the car. The triangle windows were open. I popped the cap up, aimed it into the car, and sprayed the days old sun baked rotten egg and dog poop soup over every available surface of the inside of his car down the window wells, into the air conditioner vents, and soaking into crevices and upholstery. I tossed the Gatorade bottle of horror into the dumpster, went back inside, and went to sleep. The next day was a warm one. It was one of the great joys of my life to have been home that afternoon at just the right time, to be startled by a man's voice screaming, What the F? What the F? What the F? I ran upstairs to the window he regularly fumigated, and through the blinds watched the scene unfold. The dude had opened the driver's side door and repeatedly moved his head closer to sniff and then gag, like he refused to believe the smell was coming from his car. He opened the other door to investigate, he kept yelling, what the F? And then he ran off. He came back a few minutes later wearing dishwashing gloves and carrying a stucco bucket full of sudsy water, a sponge, and a scrub brush. 
he spent the next half hour scream growling, holding his breath, bobbing his head into the car and scrubbing, pulling his head out to gag and scream, what the F, and taking deep breaths to go back in. The scrubbing and retching and screaming were increasingly interspersed with pounding on the dashboard and the roof, kicking his rims and loudly vowing revenge at the sky. Within about 30 minutes, he was surrounded by about 10 other dudes standing in a wide half circle around the car, some drinking beers, watching the show, laughing, and offering pointers, like King of the Hill come to life. It took him roughly an hour to realize that the battle had been lost. The dudes yelling became hoarse and whimpery. He retrieved his toolbox, removed a wrench, and started doing something new to the interior. He suddenly pulled out the entire driver's seat, walked away with it, and angrily heaved it into the dumpster. He did the same with the passenger seat. Then he took the bucket over and dumped the soapy poo soup water next to the dumpster, brought the bucket back to the car, turned it upside down, placed it where the driver's seat used to be, sat on it, and, I crap you not, drove off that way. I never saw the car again. He never drove it back. That and his pride must have been a total loss. My greatest regret is that because smartphones didn't exist, I have no recording of that glorious day. Now, we normally read the full story here, and I usually skip over the little TLDR section at the bottom, where they summarize their story in one short paragraph. But in this one, it's too good to pass up. It says, TLDR, arrogant dude bro, poisons a struggling single parent and child with his hoopty and refuses to stop. So parent totals the car using $5 in supplies and dog poo. Parent waits until the statute of limitations has long passed, then brags about it on the internet. Okay, this one hurt a little bit. OP obviously didn't know very much about cars, they stated that themselves. But in this case, hmm, this could have been a typical modified turbo rotary or something like that that probably cost a lot of money. Fumy, loud engine, needs a long warm-up time every time it's driven? Yeah, that sounds just about right. OP could have had a hand in destroying a very expensive car that that person put a lot of time into. But this is nuclear revenge, so these things happen. This next story comes to us from Nika Markey 99 I found out my sister has been boinking my boyfriend behind my back. I get even. Let's jump right in. I have never ever thought I would be telling this story on Reddit of all effing places. But since I've been seeing everyone share their revenge stories, I got a little inspired. So I thought I would share mine. Beware, long post ahead. Little backstory first, I was born into a broken family. My father was a drug addict. My mother on the other hand was the kindest, strongest woman I know. Fortunately, they separated just after the birth of my younger sister, who was only younger than me by a year. I took after my mother, and I say this in the most non-cocky way, I did well in school and got good grades. I was pretty and fit. I was kind to everyone who deserved it. My sister though, apart from my mother's looks, she got everything else from dad. Now, the thing is, my father was a horrible effing person, even before he became a drug addict. He was an arrogant, selfish, insufferable prick, and not only that, he also cheated on my mother multiple times while she was pregnant with me and my sister. He was so horrible to the point that when he left, my mother said that it was the happiest day of her life. She continued raising us all by herself, while my dad went to God knows where. And you know what? I have never even missed him. 18 years later, and me and my sister are all grown up, and the thing is, we've never really been that close. We fought a lot when we were younger, but it was all usual sibling fights. As we grew, we fought less and less, and we were able to coexist like all siblings do. And though I didn't express it all the time, I did love her. Here's where it all goes to crap. In my senior year of high school, I started dating one of my classmates. He had just transferred during that year and said that he liked me immediately and asked me to go out with him if I was interested. I gave the guy a chance. It goes extremely well, and just two months later, we were officially dating. He was sweet, would treat me to lunch, take me to places, and was just a great boyfriend overall. We continued to date through our first year and second year of college, 
and he comes over at our house pretty frequently, and my mom even lets him stay the night. It came to the point that he would come there even when I wasn't, and I thought nothing of it. I was even glad that he felt so comfortable there. Until one day, just a month before our anniversary, I text him that I would be home later than usual because I still had something to do in school. I was already at my third year, and I was busier than I was before. Since we usually go home together, he asks me what time do I think I'll be home, and I said probably after dinner, so he can pick me up then. He says okay. Fortunately though, I managed to finish earlier than I thought, and instead of texting him to pick me up, I decided to surprise him by coming to his house since it's been a while since we spent time together and I missed him. When I got there, his sister, whom I was very close with, was visibly confused and immediately asks me what I was doing there. I told her that I was there to see her brother and she becomes even more confused and says, he told me he was coming to your house to see you though. He left hours ago. This time, I'm the one who's confused. And so I quickly turned around and went home. Thankfully, our houses were only 15 minutes apart from each other, so I got there quickly. The next 20 minutes were like hell. I came home to find his bike outside. The house was dark, and I tried my best to go inside as quietly as I could. By the time I got up the stairs, I hear it. Moans. Female and male. The male ones sounding particularly like my boyfriend. Tears immediately flooded my eyes. I didn't even need to see to know it was him, my boyfriend of almost three years, effing my sister. My feet suddenly have a mind of their own, and I yank the door open. I was seething at this point. The bee was on him like a mechanical bull. I stood there as my now ex pushes her off of him, shocked as he puts his clothes back on in light speed and starts spewing excuses. I wasn't listening at all. I was sobbing so much I couldn't breathe. The butthole follows me all the way downstairs and I yell at him that if he doesn't leave that instant, I would tell his entire family. He leaves and I was left with my sister. I couldn't even look at her. I stayed downstairs calming myself down until my mom came home from work. She immediately notices something is wrong, but I don't tell her yet. Dinner starts and I felt like crying again. And you know what's even worse? When my sister came down and sat just across from me, I saw no hint of remorse or guilt on her face. Absolutely none. I felt sick. I wanted to vomit, and I swear that at some point during dinner, the evil bee even smirked. A week comes by and I don't say anything. I was so hurt. My ex wasn't saying anything too. No phone calls, texts, nothing. And so did my sister. Not a single effing sorry. I felt so defeated. I was crying multiple times a day and couldn't even focus in school. One day, I finally snapped and I tell my mother everything. She was extremely disappointed. She scolds my sister, but she didn't even seem to care. And then, suddenly I remembered, my ex had told me his passwords. He had told me early in our relationship, and I never bothered to open because I was never the type to go through my SO's messages. I trusted the mother effer, and this is what I get. Anyway, I managed to open his messenger account, and there I see hundreds of messages between him and my sister. I felt weak in the knees. It had been going on for almost four months then. I took screenshots. It turns out they had been going out while I would be at school. All three of us were from different schools. My sister couldn't get into mine because her grades were too low, and so was my boyfriend's. My pain quickly turned into anger, and I wanted nothing more than to make them both pay. I couldn't stomach the sight of my sister. The fact that she would go behind my back like that over some guy made me effing sick. We were supposed to always be there for each other. After a month, I asked my mother if I can move out and live with my aunt for a while because I just couldn't take it anymore. She was sad, but she understood. I felt so sorry for her. She held my sister accountable for what she did, but at the end of the day, she was still her daughter, so she can't completely turn her back on her. I didn't want to give her the burden of having to choose, so I did instead. So I moved out and lived with my aunt and promised to keep in touch. The next six months was basically me putting my crap back together. 
I became a working student and did some freelance work to earn some money. And as I started to earn more, I dropped out of school completely and became a full-time freelancer. As the months went by, I would earn more and more and I had more than enough money to spend for myself. And from then on, I started to send money to my mom monthly. One day, I got curious and decided to check on my sister and ex. When I unblocked them, I regretted it instantly. The buttholes were still together, and my sister was even flaunting their relationship on Instagram. Suddenly, it's as if no time has passed by at all, and I was angry yet again. I scroll through more pictures, and it was obvious that my sister was completely in love with him. I acted on anger. I sent the screenshots I took from before and sent it to our cousins and told them everything. They all ended up hating her. And then I sent it to my ex's sister and also told her everything. She punched him and tells their parents. And a day later, I receive a text from them apologizing on behalf of their son. It made me feel slightly better. A week later, my mom asks me to come home to spend the weekend. I decide to say yes this time. I stop by a mall on the way to get a gift from my mom and guess who I see? My ex-boyfriend with a girl who wasn't my sister holding hands. I laugh hard. The urge to take out my phone to take a picture and send it to my sister was so strong, but I stopped myself. It wouldn't be painful enough. So I hide where he can't see me and followed them. After about an hour, she goes to the bathroom. I follow her there. I approach her when she comes out of the cubicle and say, Is the guy you're with your boyfriend? She looked a little bit scared and confused, but she answers yes nonetheless. I quickly tell her that the same guy is currently dating my sister and even showed her some pictures. The girl was completely horrified. She said she had no idea that he was seeing someone else, and I fought the urge to laugh. I tell her to get rid of him quickly and I'll tell her everything she needs to know, but also asked her not to dump him yet. So she makes up some excuse to him about an emergency at home and they go their separate ways for the day. We meet up at a coffee shop close to the mall afterwards. There I spill everything, including all the details about the cheating. When I finished, she looked so mad, almost as if it happened to her. And then she goes on to reveal that a longtime boyfriend of hers actually cheated on her as well. We talked some more, and as time passed by, I came to discover that the girl was actually really sweet, and I felt sorry that she became a victim of my ex as well. She asked me if I was going to get revenge, and I said yes, but I needed her help. But I also told her she could say no if she didn't want to, but she said she wanted to help. So I told her my plan and she was all for it. I came home that night excited. My mom seemed pleased and my sister looked a little pissed. I didn't give an F though, since I had the knowledge that my ex-boyfriend, the guy she destroyed our relationship for, was on his way to destroy her. The girl and I talked for the next three weeks I was there and she would send me screenshots of her and my ex's convos and also pics of them together. We continued to talk even after I came back to my aunt's house, and exactly two months after we met, the plan was finally in action. It was a week before my ex and my sister's anniversary, yes, they had an anniversary, and I was about to give her the greatest gift. By that time, my ex had confessed to the other girl about his relationship with my sister, but she told him that it was okay and that they could still be together because she didn't care. Little did he know, her and I were basically best friends now and had come up with a master plan to ruin his life. I come home again and spent the week there leading up to their anniversary. It was the longest week of my life. The day finally comes and after my sister leaves to go to his house, I wait a few hours. Then I FaceTime his sister to ask if the two buttholes were home. She says yes. Then I send it. Dozens of pictures of my ex with the other girl and screenshots of their conversations. Ones where he was telling her how much he loves her and how he's planning to leave my sister for her soon. There was one where he even expressed how annoying he found her and that he sometimes wants to strangle her. A whole bunch of other screenshots where he insults her, calls her stupid, desperate, and many more. 
He also said she was awful in bed and was way too noisy, and that he barely touched her the past few days. Ouch. But it wasn't enough for me. The final touch was a three minute long video of my friend and my ex boinking. Yes, she gave me her full consent to send it. It was hilarious. The butthole was enjoying it so much, and I know my sister would probably have a seizure once she watches it. Afterwards, I wait. I was still on FaceTime with his sister, and after a while, her and I hear it. Screaming. Objects being thrown. More screaming. His sister comes upstairs to check on them, and I hear everything. My sister was sobbing, and what's even more effed up is my ex didn't even try to deny any of it, and asked her to just leave. Her sister and I talk some more, and she tells me how she's never liked my sister, and so did their parents. They said that they would ignore her whenever she would come by their house. She would even ask about me sometimes just to piss her off. After about an hour, my sister finally comes home, and I sat there grinning like a devil as she steps into the living room, face puffy from crying. We make eye contact, and I smirked at her and said, you deserve it, before going upstairs. I don't speak to her again, and for days she refused to even leave her room. The satisfaction I felt was through the roof, and I even told my mom that I could move back in now. But it didn't end there because my ex had gotten my sister pregnant. A huge part of me wasn't shocked, but my mom was of course disappointed. We had to tell the rest of our family, and they were all disappointed with her as well. Before she gave birth, my sister told my mom she was going to move in with my ex's family, since they have to take care of their baby, and my mom refused to let him step foot in our house again. But since our houses were really close to each other, she agreed. It was pathetic. It was obvious that she still wanted to be with him even after everything he did, but hey, it wasn't my problem anymore. But according to my ex's sister, though, her parents weren't too happy about the whole thing. And although my ex said he would take responsibility of his child, he didn't want anything to do with my sister anymore. Effing butthole. So I continued to live my life, working, going out, and focusing on becoming even better. It didn't take long for me to finally be happy again, and all the pain and betrayal felt like a distant memory. I reconnected with my old friends, and even started dating again. I also kept in touch with the girl who helped me with my revenge. She, of course, has dumped my ex, broken up with him just the day after it all went down. And we're genuinely good friends now and meet when we can. I don't keep in touch with my sister at all, but according to my ex's sister, she's absolutely miserable because she had to drop out of school and my ex barely spoke to her and would always be gone, sometimes for days, and even brought home girls on multiple occasions. He also wasn't there when she gave birth. I didn't feel sorry for her at all since she chose to stay with him, but I did feel sorry for the kid for having those two buttholes as his parents. They would go to our house at least three times a week to see my mother, and my sister would completely ignore my existence. Guess what? The bee still hasn't apologized. I didn't really care at that point, so ignored it. But one time, I kindly offered to buy her baby some clothes, and she fixed me with the nastiest look before saying, We don't need your effing money. I was appalled, and then I was pissed again. Alright then, if that's how she wanted to play. Funnily enough, I ran into my ex at a bar just a couple days later. He looks effing terrible, and I questioned what I even saw in him. He sees me and actually looks happy. I, on the other hand, no longer felt anything for him, only disgust. He tries to make conversation, telling me I looked great, and even apologizes. I was shocked, but his apology didn't really mean crap to me anymore. Later that night, I received a bunch of messages from him. He was apologizing again, and then went on to say how much he regrets cheating on me before begging for another chance and swears that this time things would be different and that he was going to change for me. I laughed so hard I fell off my bed. The ocean would dry up before I'll even think about taking his butt back. But since my sister pissed me off once again and I was feeling a little petty, I send her the screenshots of those messages with the caption, This is your baby daddy? I knew she was still in love with him, even after everything, 
and I knew that it would hurt her to see how he's willing to change for me, but not for her, the mother of his darn child. He barely even gave her money for their child. It was only ex's parents and my mom who supported her financially. She blocked me. <laughs> and no, I don't ever take my ex back. Last I heard, he started using drugs. Fast forward to now, I continue to thrive while she continues to be miserable. We recently had a family reunion, and at one point, she says to our relatives that she's having a hard time. And one of our cousins looks at her dead in the eyes and says, well, maybe if you hadn't effed your sister's boyfriend, you wouldn't be in this position. She was absolutely dumbfounded, and there were tears in her eyes, and I almost choked on my wine to keep from laughing. She probably didn't think they knew. Well, now she does, and they all didn't bother to hide how much they despised her. She had no one on her side, and was considered the disappointment of the family. But she only has herself to blame. Now, OP added an edit on at the end. It says, by the way, if anyone gets confused why we still lived with our parents during college, I am Filipina and this happened in the Philippines. Here, we don't move out until we have kids, and sometimes not even then. Some people don't believe, and honestly, I understand. I wish it was fake, truly. This particular event has caused so much stress on our entire family, but I do get some of y'all. About the girl who helped me, I was actually really shocked myself with how willing she was to participate. There definitely had been times where I was scared she would out me to my ex and sister, but I guess it all just reminded her of the situation with her ex, and she also seemed mad about being made into a side chick. I didn't expect she would send a video. I asked her so many times if she was sure. My ex was a horrible person, but he was attractive and good in bed, as much as I hate to admit. She basically used him for it, and I don't find anything wrong with that. He deserved it. And to be honest, I would have done the same if it was the other way around. I get why it might seem made up, but I've literally witnessed much wilder crap happen. I had a friend who got sent a video of her then-boyfriend and another girl boinking as well. The girl sent it because she wanted her boyfriend to herself. It happens more frequently than one might think. Bees can be messy as F these days. But again, I get why it might seem unbelievable. Believe what you want, it's not like it would affect any of us negatively. What's done is done, have a good day. I can't believe the gall of this guy to actually try and get back together with her afterwards. Like, hey, would you like to come and try and co-parent the child of the sister I cheated on you with? Wouldn't that make them like Uncle Daddy and Auntie Mom? <laughs> this next story comes to us from... Never gonna give you up. <laughs> Karen gets burned. Let's jump right in. This is a burner account. Tried posting on Pro, but my burner account doesn't have enough karma. Names and places have been changed to protect the innocent and the not so innocent. Some years ago, I started working for a heavy industrial manufacturing company. I lucked out and got a great supervisor for a boss, Joe. The work was hard, working 12-hour days for 13 days in a row, and then a Sunday off, and then back for another 13 days. I was young and didn't mind. It helped my wife and I save up for a house. After about six months, Joe noticed I was picking up on the work pretty fast and promoted me to a group leader position. This came with a raise and increased responsibility that most other workers didn't want. Joe would put me in troubled groups in his department, and I would work on general improvements and figuring out the issues. This was a union shop, and the mentality was to just put in your hours. Don't work harder or smarter, just do your time and don't kill the job, was the unspoken motto. After a few years, Joe was promoted to manager, and he transferred me with him to his departments. While I wasn't a supervisor yet, I was the supervisor in all but name. The supervisors loved it because they never had to leave the office, and I liked it because it was a good learning experience. I made a good reputation and got a lot of respect from workers and from management. Eventually, Joe's areas were doing so well, he was promoted to plant manager. As before, he wanted to promote me with him, this time to a supervisor spot. We talked in length because the only supervisor spot open was working for Karen. Karen was female, a minority, and a member of the LGBTQ community. 
She was the poster child on the company website of the inclusiveness in the workplace. Literally, her face was the one they used. She was also a freshly minted manager, and Joe was not confident in her abilities. But me, being the plucky go-getter with a can-do attitude, decided to take the position. I had to interview with Karen and got to meet some of her supervisors. They were very quiet and reserved. Once I was promoted, I worked in tandem with another supervisor, Chris. Chris was young, had one small child, and his wife was pregnant and a stay-at-home mom. During the first week, everything was going well. I was learning all the employees, getting to know the process, and getting my feeling for the area. During the second week, Chris's wife went into labor and she had a hard time. Chris went on paternity leave for six weeks, and I was tossed into the deep end in charge of the whole area solo with 60 employees. I was barely treading water, but I was doing my best. When I would ask Karen for guidance or assistance, she would scoff like it was beneath her and tell me, if I have to do your job, then I don't need you. So I gritted my teeth and worked my tail off. My wife got me a smartwatch and I was averaging 25,000 steps a day trying to keep everything running. We were holding our own and employees all did what they could to help as the situation was not ideal for everyone. A few weeks in, I was reviewing some quality documents and I noticed that one of the quality gates was not being followed. I emailed the info to the quality engineers and they lost their minds. This was a four-hour operation on a 20-hour part that we were skipping entirely. Turns out, one of the reasons Karen got promoted was because she was running her department so efficiently. Then it came to light that she made the decision to skip this quality process, saving that 20% of time. Except the engineers never signed off on this, and it caused massive damage control. The process had to be reinstated, and the parts that were never checked had to have warranty extensions. This caused the company to have egg on their face and Karen to look bad. During this time, Karen also became more vindictive. She would openly tell people she would never be fired and could do what she wanted. She would walk the departments and if she didn't like someone, she would make the supervisors write them up by the end of the day. She wanted us to find a reason and if we didn't, she would take it out on the supervisors. For example, forcing the supervisors to stay late to do inventory or something else menial just because she could. She would not let the supervisors make any decisions until she approved. So something like overtime had to wait for her approval and she would not respond until the end of the day, causing the departments to scramble. Then if there weren't enough overtime employees to do the work, she would blame it on the supervisors. While the supervisors knew this wasn't right, we all needed our jobs and tried to do the best we could for Karen and the employees. We were mainly rodeo clowns to Karen being the bull. The first day Chris was back, him and I were both pulled into Karen's office. She started berating me on how poor of a job I was doing, making her look bad, and how I never came to her for help. This made me speechless because of the previous comments she made and the fact that supervisor work was beneath her. After the meeting, I was still a bit stunned, but I put it together that she was about to railroad me out of the company, and this was the first step. I called Joe and asked for a meeting that same day. When I got together with Joe, I started telling him about the things that were going on that he had no idea. The harassment, the abuse, the vindictive nature. Ironically, while I was speaking with him, another supervisor called him to complain about Karen as well with the same grievances. Joe was stunned and said he would speak with Karen, but he gave me carte blanche on any open slot in the company starting the next day. He really didn't want to lose me. I did a lateral transfer to a different department, doing engineering IT work, and I thought that was the end of it. A few weeks later, I was leaving work and Karen mentioned that I never turned in my laptop and phone to her. I told her I didn't know I had to, but that I could give them to her tomorrow. She smirked and said she would get it back soon enough. I didn't think too much of it at the time. After about six months, I had my review with my new boss, Jake. The review went great. He was very happy with my work and was a bit surprised at how fast I picked up things. At the end of the meeting, Jake mentioned offhand how Karen tried to intervene in the review and get me fired. But Joe stepped in and squashed it. Okay, Karen, now you pissed me off. 
after I left Karen's department, the turnover rate went through the roof. The supervisors were quitting at a rate of one every three months. Keep in mind that this is a legacy company that had multi-generations working. Fathers, mothers, sons, entire families. Some areas had three generations working side by side, and yet Karen was rolling over employees and supervisors like a steamroller. Working for her became the kiss of death. I casually mentioned to Joe about the turnover, and he told me he couldn't figure out what was going on. People were quitting without notice, and no one was doing exit interviews. I told Joe that Karen was writing people up to force them out. When they would hand her the resignation letter or two weeks notice, she would tell them to leave immediately and throw away the letter. Then she would tell HR that the person quit on the spot, and that was the end of it. Joe told me that because of who she was and how high she was, the company wouldn't do anything to her until they had an airtight case. So I went to work. I took the supervisors working for Karen out drinking after work a few times a week and made sure I had my hand on the pulse. If someone was quitting, I made sure they emailed their letter of resignation to Karen and CC'd Joe and HR, stayed for their exit interview, and that they called the company Integrity Hotline for good measure. Things were progressing well, and I had all the supervisors on board except Chris. Chris really needed the job, and Karen was not writing him up. Through a stroke of luck, I found out Karen was lowballing his raises as a cost-saving measure. That's why she was not harassing him. When I told Chris, he was furious and wanted to quit on the spot. I encouraged him to speak with Joe before he leaves. Joe and Chris had a very productive meeting, and Chris decided to stay. Now all the supervisors were on board. Joe brought in an HR bigwig from the headquarters in Kansas, and over the course of a week, each supervisor was sent in for an interview discreetly without Karen knowing. By the time the interviews were over, they had emails, texts, eyewitnesses, and a mountain of evidence. This next part I heard from other people, HR, Joe, etc. Despite everything, the company wanted to keep this quiet. So they brought in Karen and said they no longer needed her and offered a very generous severance package. Karen being Karen lost it on the HR people. She threatened to sue for discrimination and even called a lawyer. That's when the company pulled out the stack of evidence and rescinded the severance offer. After a few months, Karen found a new job as a plant manager in a different factory. And I found out where. I casually mentioned to the union reps at my factory where Karen was working and suggested that maybe they should give the union at the other factory a call. She was fired within three months for employee harassment. Last I heard, she had to sell her house and move out of state to find a job. Okay, my main question on this one is when Karen cut out that one quality step, that one that was supposed to take four hours to complete, which kind of tells you how important that step would be, why didn't the company fire her on the spot? it opened up a huge liability for the company. Also, having to do a warranty extension for all of the parts that went through and didn't have that quality step, well, that would cost a lot of money too. And I don't think Karen was worth that much money. This next story comes to us from Lost Cause 2021. I crushed my ex-wife's hopes after she cheated on me. Let's jump right in. Bit of background, I'm 36 male as of now. The characters have been a bit altered by their names. Rebecca, my ex-wife, now 34. James, my college buddy and the guy Rebecca cheated on me with. Saladin, my other guy friend. Lisa, Saladin's cousin. So Rebecca and I were what you call college sweethearts. We survived college and the hardships of life. Got married in our early 20s. I was 25, she was 23. Ever since we got married, things were rocky, not from the start, but situation-wise. I was in medical while she was an accounting major. There were things that were okay with me, but not with her. Despite being married, she acted like she was a free bird. She was. It's a good thing, but there was marital neglect from her side. 2016, she joins James's company as an accountant because it pays well. I was happy because, hey, he's a buddy of mine. Slowly, she started to complain about things that were in place. She didn't like where we lived, had problems with everything I did. She didn't like the food she used to. I'm a great cook and she loved my foods. Our fights intensified by a margin. 
where she would call me names. I'm good for nothing. She earned more than me, coming to this part later on. Drastic turn was here that Rebecca and James were hanging out with our set of mutual friends. I got the word of it and it seemed off. I confronted both of them, to which they both said it was a sudden plan, and I was out in the field. Coincidentally, it happened on the same day I was out of the city. They might have planned it beforehand, which I'm not sure of. 2017, the year my marriage blew up, so I was sure there was something because my bedroom became an effing dead one. I was increasingly paranoid, and whenever I tried to address things, I was turned down. Now, I'm not a saint. I constantly yelled at her to tell me what was going on because there was just something off. Your favorite person rarely talks or does stuff with you and they claim it's nothing? Does this sound okay? It was also the year we were at our peak financially because our debts were paid off. My friends and I decided to open up a medical shop that provided medicine as a side venture. So one of the friends was Saladin. He proposed that we celebrated at a pub. When we go there, I notice a girl that looks exactly like Rebecca. She was dancing with another man, and it was quite dark. I get a closer look, lo and behold, it's Rebecca and James, dancing hand to hand. I wasn't much bothered about it because, hey, they're friends. I was here with my colleagues, and she was there with him, but it was bothering me. I decide to send her a text asking where she was. She's usually on her way home at this time. She told me she was already at home. Now that was a red flag. I told her to stop lying because I knew she wasn't. I could clearly see her that she was getting paranoid and told me she was on her way. She left the pub afterwards. That night, I asked her about James. The look she gave me was as if she saw a ghost because she was not expecting that question. That look was what told me something was definitely up. If you ask your SO about a friend, they should act normally, but the way she acted was abnormal. That night, I snooped her phone. Curiosity was killing me. The password was changed, so I couldn't see the phone. The next day, I saw her password and snooped it. There were hundreds of thousands of texts right there. Countless nudes, calling him daddy, degrading comments. My wife and I made a vow to each other that if there was ever anything we needed to explore, we would be transparent to each other. She broke that vow too. She confided in him about how much thrill she felt that night at the pub. I went through everything. What hurt the most was she herself told me if one of us ever got bored of the other or needed to spice things up, we will let each other know. She destroyed everything. I couldn't look at her the way I used to anymore. I cried at night and confronted her stupidly without any evidence the next morning. She yelled at me and stormed out after telling me I was abusive and insane. She told all our friends that I was abusive. That afternoon, they created a messenger group where everyone ganged up to troll me. When she came home that night, she told me she was in love with James and wants a divorce. I told her to talk first, but it turned into her berating me. I yelled at her and she called the cops. I was asked to spend the night elsewhere. I went to my sister's and when I returned the next morning, James's car was here. He spent the night here. There was nothing needed to explain. He was doing it on purpose. Heck, she was doing it on purpose. I went to see a lawyer as we did not have a prenup. She already filed a complaint about me being abusive and it didn't look good for me. Not once did she try to apologize. Not once did she try to make amends. Our country law doesn't count infidelity as a fault. So even with that, she's entitled to half of my everything. But her complaint can screw me up. Few days after that, while I was still living with my sister, I tried contacting Rebecca, but she won't reply to me. Rebecca hit me up, telling me we should get divorced. That's it. 12 years of relationship, four years of marriage, and she ends it with a text. I was effing convinced that James was taking my place. She handed me the divorce papers. Everyone from our friend circle was convinced that I was an effing abuser and James was her savior. She did the right thing to cheat on me. We were officially divorced during the start of 2018. She was already dating James open during our divorce. He was her life. 
I lost my job, my house, my reputation in her little affair. I had to change the city to move somewhere else and restart again. Saladin helped me massively in that fresh start. He got me a decent paying job that was nowhere like my previous one, but it was better than the rest. We became close buddies while I was working to earn back what I had. Dating life was over for me. I just couldn't trust anyone. It was a complete no contact between me and Rebecca. Last I heard, she moved in with James. They were doing great. Revenge part. End of 2020, my life was actually blowing up. COVID helped our cause with broken backs, but filled our pockets. Our pharmacy venture turned huge, so I was able to make much more money. I met a friend of mine from whom I got a tip that James and Rebecca were done. James cheated on her and left her, but Rebecca had a child with James. He was absent since birth, so he did not sign the birth certificate, so Rebecca is raising that child as a single parent. She tried dating, but she was not over me or James. The audacity. Part of me was happy with it, but gosh, I really missed her. I sent her an email asking how she was doing. She wasn't expecting to hear from me. We exchanged mails and reconnected. Our first meet was in 2021 after several years. She looked like crap. She gained weight, lost the charm, and looked utterly exhausted all the time. Frankly, just her look made my blood boil and triggered me, but I also wanted to take my revenge on her. Life had already done that on my part, but I'm a butthole. I wasn't done with her. She told me about James and reopened the earlier wounds. I got my closure, which made me feel a bit better, I guess. She said she was sorry. She wasn't thinking straight what she was doing. James poisoned her mind against me. I told her I will forgive her if she comes clean to everyone and clears my name. She did that, losing a lot of friends, but she deserved that. My name was clean. She wanted us to date again. Clear words make me raise that butthole James's child. I told her I would agree to it, but we needed to date and marry first. Only then I will legally adopt her child. That little guy is adorable and I had taken a liking to him. Here is the truth. I was already seeing someone. Pretty safe to say I was cheating on that woman with Rebecca. She was a client of mine from a different country. We were in a long distance relationship. Rebecca and I were living in different cities, so I never moved in with her. But I played it well by saying I need to travel for business. So I was only getting Rebecca's hopes up to crush her like she crushed me. We were getting intimate, but condoms were used. Rebecca felt she found love again. I pushed her to therapy to get her to be normal again. Everyone was commenting how she was getting more happier with me. She would praise and then say sorry. Do little things for me that she used to when she was married to me. Trust me when I say I had a lot of emotions attached to this woman. I considered my revenge if it was a good thing to break her heart. She might be traumatized for a lifetime. But she did not think of my heart and we were married. Why should I think of hers? Her birthday was coming up last October. Lockdown was eased up and my someone, it's Lisa, was in my city. For the birthday gift, I grabbed Rebecca for ring shopping. She picked out her favorite ring and I got it wrapped. She was elated because of that. That night, she came up to me crying that she was sorry for hurting me. She looked genuinely remorseful, but I had no feelings for her except indifference. Lisa was Saladin's cousin. I already told her everything beforehand. She was against my revenge idea, but I managed to convince her somehow. She was uncomfortable with it, but understood that I needed to go through it. On Rebecca's birthday, I drove her to our favorite spot when we were married. It's a nature place. Lisa was already waiting there. I introduced Lisa to Rebecca that Lisa's my girlfriend. Rebecca went white and asked me what do I mean? What is she then? I introduced her to Lisa as Rebecca, my ex-wife and friend with benefits. There and then, I proposed to Lisa with that ring. Rebecca went mad and started yelling to which I replied, how the F can she expect us to work out when she nuked us? I'm never dating a dirt peg like her again. She asked me again and again if we meant nothing. I told her no. Sleeping with her was compensation for the pain. 
I got her to clear out the pain she put me through. Lisa was holding me back. She saw Rebecca was hurting. I told Rebecca that she needs to leave. She told everyone that I cheated and I was a butthole. This time, I took it as pride. Everyone saw the dirtbag she was. She cheated on me and made me pay a high price for a falsified abuse. Now, she wants me to raise her kid and date her? The last we connected was in December of last year. She wrote me a letter about how sorry she is because she can't imagine putting me through all the pain that she already put me through. She hoped I lived a better life. Last I heard, she was completely uninterested in dating. Looks crap. As of me, Lisa and I stopped dating. There were differences between us. I just want to get this completely clear. So, you got cheated on, your reputation was besmirched, so you responded by moving on with your life for a short time. Starting a new relationship, cheating on your new partner with your ex, using a revenge moment to propose to the partner you were cheating on in front of the ex you were cheating with. Yikes. You hurt the partner you claim to care about probably almost as much as the ex you were trying to hurt in that moment. Yeah, it's true that your ex needs therapy for what they put you through, but I think you need it more. I thank you for watching, I hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.